Okay guys, welcome. This is chapter 25, Human Nutrition. So let's go through this one. Human Nutrition is all about um, the body's function. Right? We need nutrients to be able to get the jobs done, whether we're talking about us physically moving around or whether we're talking about um, the movement of fluids through the body or tissue growth or reproduction. So nutrition is the key to making all that stuff happen. Okay, and so when we're talking about nutrient deficiencies, um, some things can happen where if you're lacking a certain vitamin or a certain nutrient that's usually pretty small, it can lead to bigger problems such as um, lack of vitamin C. So if you don't have vitamin C, this is something called scurvy, you end up with this weakness in the collagen, um, the gums start to bleed, the skin bruises pretty easily. Um, so it's not something that you would expect to happen, um, but it can if you don't take care of it and you don't have that deficiency cleared up. So for the nutrients, when we're talking about these, um, there's different groups. You have things called macronutrients and micronutrients, and then you've got the big classes um, that we classify everything into, carbs, lipids, proteins, minerals, vitamins, and of course water. So it's important to understand those things that are macronutrients, we need large quantities of them. Those would be like carbs, lipids, proteins. Things that we need very small quantities, we call those micronutrients. Okay, that's like vitamins and minerals. So every food is a mixture of these nutrients. Now, when you have something like junk food, they still have nutritional value, right? They give us sugars, fats, but they don't give quite a bit of vitamins or minerals, which means we call them empty calories. They're for short bursts of energy, but they're not really something that's going to help build up tissue in your body like you need it. Okay. So if you look at a piece of bread, right? A piece of bread has mostly carbs, but it's also got water, proteins, lipids, and these tiny little micronutrients. Um, bread has calcium in it, stuff like that. So it's important to understand that the big thing we think of is not the only thing that's inside all your food. So when we talk about these, we're classifying them in several ways. The main groups are your carbs, lipids, proteins. Then you've got your minerals, your vitamins, and your water. Okay. Now it's important to understand what all these mean. The harder, or the most challenging one here to think about is um, water, because water itself is not a um, micro or a macronutrient at all, really. It's just uh, something that the body needs to be able to um, to get through. Because without water, you're not going to have many of those chemical reactions that occur in the body, they're just not going to happen. Okay, so that's an important thing to think about. So one of the biggest group that we think of is carbs, and that tends to be, for us, glucose is the one you think of, right? But some organisms don't uh, carry them as such, right? So it tends up being a starch, is your storage one for your plants. For animals, it's something called glycogen, but we all end up getting them from natural food sources. So like fruits, vegetables, milk, and honey are also carb heavy items, right? Um, most animal foods do not contain carbs except for those. And so once we get them in our body, we're able to store them in glycogen, okay? So one of the ways we like to get carbs is in a form of fiber because that's a non-digestible carbohydrate. That's a good thing because it helps pass through the body. Um, it's what makes the feces or the poop comes out um, pretty solid. So that means you're getting good amounts of fiber. When you have a lot of beans, peas, nuts, fruits, that kind of stuff, those things make your um, bowel movements go very well. So whole grain products also do this as well. And um, when you refine it, when you have like white bread and stuff like that, and it's not very good fiber, it removes those fibers, the vitamins, um, certain minerals, okay? So all that stuff gets removed because it was refined to give you um, basically starch. So it's very carb heavy, but not all the little things you need, the micronutrients, okay? So there's all the fiber rich foods. You got bananas, apples, nuts, uh, legumes, all that stuff. And so we don't consider fiber to be a nutrient, it's just a form of carbohydrate. So it cannot be digested, it ends up usually going um, as big particles. So because of that, it ends up adding bulk to your fecal material and it makes, helps you feel full, right? So if you have a lot of food with fiber, you feel full, but you don't really, um, you don't really need to eat more. And so that's a good thing. Um, 
And then one of the important things too is we think that it helps with the um, small intestine. It prevents cholesterol from being absorbed. So that means that it can prevent heart disease. And so unfortunately, sometimes you end up eating too much carbs. And the problem is we're eating the wrong kinds, right? So most of our carbs tend to be um, low fiber, um, really refined carbs that go really quickly through the body. And so we end up eating lots of sugars and that leads of course to obesity, okay? It also can lead to uh, diabetes and cardiovascular, cardiovascular diseases. So those three things are kind of the big killers in the United States. So it's important to understand, and then here's another one, uh, kind of an urban myth, is the idea that if you give children too much carbohydrates, that are too much sugar, they become hyperactive. That's actually not true. So go figure, right? And so these are all the different types of dietary sugar, right? What are you supposed to do? Well, don't eat so much sweet, candy, soft drinks, ice cream, pastries, right? Um, when you do eat sugar, you try to eat that um, uh, mostly natural sugar, right? Fresh fruits, canned fruits are not a good one because they have a lot of heavy syrups. Less jelly, jam, preserves, those kind of things. And avoiding potatoes and processed food, like pasta and stuff like that. If it's Basically, if it's white bread or white pasta, it's not really good for you, so... Then we've got lipids, right? Lipids are the fats, right? Fats are a good thing because they actually help keep the skin pretty uh, nice and tight. So um, if you've got oily skin, if you've got like um, things like that, those actually are good because it helps keep the cell membranes uh, smooth. So you end up with less wrinkles, things like that. And if you use creams and stuff for lotions, they tend to have a lot of triglycerides or fats and oils in them. That's a good thing for them. But, um, you know, when it comes for us, there's a, uh, there's a difference in the types that we want on our helping our skin and then the kinds that um, you know, end up kind of in the body system. So there's a lot of foods with good fats in them, right? That's the stuff down here. Um, your fatty fish, your oils, your soybeans, stuff like that. Those are good. But then, of course, there's also bad fats. Typically, it's animal fats, right? Butter, meat. Um, whole milk, those kind of things, those animal fats are not good because we end up using them uh, quite a bit and they end up um, in the blood system. And once you do that, you end up building up cholesterol, which like I mentioned, that's a good thing for your skin, but it can end up um, gathering into your, uh, into your body and thus leading to heart disease, right? So those things end up building up in your cardiovascular system. You see them in the blood vessels, and they block, they cause blockages, and that can lead to stroke, heart attack, high blood pressure, things like that. Okay, and so what do you do? You want to make sure you eat things like poultry, fish, beans, you know, protein like that, and lipids like that. Those are good, and that will help reduce that cholesterol that's going to be collecting in your body later. Okay, and so we mentioned proteins. Proteins are important. You need certain amino acids, about nine out of twenty, that have to be included in the diet. So you do need to eat things like eggs, milk, poultry, right? Um, the thing is that you have to eat them in moderation and it depends on what kind, right? So if we have plant food, it's great to be getting protein out of there, but it's very challenging to be a vegetarian because you have to eat a lot of to tofu, soy milk, other types of processed foods. Um, if you don't get that in your diet, you're going to end up um, with a protein problem, and that's going to lead to muscle fatigue, loss like that. So you don't want to end up having that problem. And again, we eat too much protein. That can end up in your urine as urea, and that can lead to something later on called kidney stones. So you don't want to have too much protein in the diet because then you can have other sorts of problems as well. And of course, it's been linked. Having too much protein is the same thing. Uh, eating too much fat. So you end up with a cardiovascular issue there too. So then we get to the minerals, right? There's 20 what we call essential minerals, or those things are the ones you see kind of at higher levels. So for example, it's different for sex, age, and um, you know body type, but most females need to have iron because they have menstruation, okay? Um, a lot of people need to take calcium to counteract osteoporosis, okay? And those people who have... Um, uh, darker skin, but they're not getting enough sunlight. They have to take vitamin D pills. Okay, so it's different depending on your body type, your age, your background, things like that. 
Okay, and so these are all the different micronutrients. Now, do I expect you to know every single one? No, but it would be helpful to kind of have this, especially when you're taking your test, to have that kind of in front of you so you can see where all these minerals come from, um, what happens if you get too much or too little of them. And so one of the big problems now is not really so much a mineral, but it's sodium, okay? People too much, use too much salt to spice their food, um, to, and there's a lot of in, in processed foods. If you like ham, bacon, lunch meats, uh, sardines, anchovies, if you're still into that stuff, that stuff has tons of salt in it and that can lead to blood pressure issues, right? The recommended in daily intake is something like 500 milligrams and the average American takes up to 4,000 or more. So that's what leads to high blood pressure and can exacerbate cardiovascular disease. Okay, and so some of those other vitamins we're talking about, vitamin C, E, and A, um, they help. But what I want you to understand is there's no wonder vitamin or wonder drug. You see that quite a bit in social media these days where somebody will say, well, look, if you take this essential oil or this essential vitamin, it'll do well for this aging and that. It's not true. You have to have a good, well-balanced diet. It'll help, but it will not fix it, right? We have certain things called antioxidants. They defend against those free radicals that cause aging and stuff like that. But that does not mean if you eat a bunch of blueberries, you're going to be young forever, right? We wish there was an easy solution, but there just is not at this point. And so it's important to understand we need all these in our diet, right? There's different ones we're talking about. We mentioned at the beginning vitamin C. That's an important one, okay? Um, another one I'd probably mention are the different vitamin Bs. You think of vitamin B as just one, but there's B1, B2, B6, B12. Those are all different ones, and you get them from various foods, but they all tend to be the same seeds, nuts, dairy products, and they can have problems if you have too little and too much of them. Um, but most people don't end up with too much. That tends to happen. So, And then here are kind of the big ones. These are the fat-soluble ones. These are vitamins A, D, E, and K. Okay, You find these in a lot of fruits and vegetables and some uh, things like milk and oil, right? So depending on where you get them, they um, can be issues, right? So you can have rickets, bone decalcification, right, weakening. So vitamin D is an important thing, actually. If you have a lot of melanin, if you're a dark-skinned person, going out in the sun actually helps you make vitamin D on your own so you don't have to actually consume as much. So that's helpful. And so there's different types of deficiencies. I mentioned rickets, right? So if you have milk, now the, nowadays they fortify milk, which means is they add this vitamin to the milk so that you'll be able to have the vitamin D you need. And so um, it's helpful because you can use this stuff after sun exposure to help keep that skin nice and organized with that cholesterol molecule. It makes it. So uh, again, if you also have high alcohol intake, it's going to absorb, it's going to mess with the absorption of certain uh, vitamins. So it's important to keep a well-balanced diet and kind of keep that stuff out of your diet at the same time. And then, of course, we get to water, which is super weird because water is not really essential in any specific form, but if we don't have it, then we won't be able to have certain chemical reactions get done, right? Uh, our body's only about 60% water. Uh, we need it. It gets in, it's in all different types of things. Some animals don't even drink water. They just get it out of their food, right? But it lubricates the joints, okay? Helps maintain body temperature. Um, and we need to have it in almost all of our foods. If we don't have water, you will die within a couple of days of it. So um, everybody's different. Women usually have to consume about uh, eight or nine glasses of water a day. Men, anywhere between 10 and 12 glasses a day, depending on how much, how big the glass is. But it depends, right? Uh, if you're working out um, constantly, like a bodybuilder type person, you probably will need more water to keep that body lubricated to make sure you don't get cramping, stuff like that. If you're, you know, sitting at home watching Netflix a lot, your water content or your water consumption doesn't have to be so high. Okay, and so one of the things we can do with our nutrition and health is calculate how much we are overweight, right? So there's something called BMI, right? Body Mass Index. And so using your weight in pounds times this coefficient number that they came up with, right? Don't ask me how, it's just something that scientists do. And dividing it by your height in inches, you can then calculate your BMI, right? The problem right now is that most Americans, many Americans, are either overweight to morbidly obese, okay? That's a problem because that's going to lead, I mean, 
before the COVID-19 virus, which be this year is now the main, is the higher, highest killer of, the, uh, of members of the United States, um, cardiovascular disease and those other related diseases are your um, main killers of Americans. So, you know, over 50% of us fall under these categories. And so that's the problem when it comes to, um, when it comes to these uh, long-term issues. Okay, and then we've got our energy intake, right? So they basically measure the calories of something. This is a bomb calorimeter. It's pretty easy. They just uh, use this wire to ignite the food. You put the food inside this chamber, and then you light it up, and you see how much energy it makes by calculating its kilocalories, okay? This is the idea of, uh, it's like thermochemistry. You basically see how much uh, heat is needed to raise the temperature of one liter of water by one degree C. So we standardize it, and then we're able to use that from there, okay? Okay, and so this right here is a calculation of how you can figure these out. So when you see on a um, food label some sort of big of calorie, right? When you see that C, it's usually a big C. There's two types. So you've got little C, which is just a calorie. The big C is the kilocalorie. So when we're looking at these, you see how it's kcal, kcal, kcal? Those stand for kilocalories. So they basically take the amount of carbs, fats, and proteins, and they multiply it by how much energy each one of those provides. And then you can add it up and tell you, okay, well, this amount of food has 221 kilocalories. So we can figure that out, and then that's what you see on those food labels. So we're talking about the energy output. We all have to have some sort of metabolic output, right? If you're just sitting here watching this video, your body is burning energy. Not nearly as much as if you were running or if you were bicycling, you know, in the French Alps. Um, your metabolic functions would go way higher. But since you're just sitting there, we all have a basal metabolic rate. So you can actually figure out what that number is and then calculate how much it would need, you would need to either gain weight, lose weight, or maintain. And you ask yourself, why would you want to gain weight? Well, bodybuilders do that, athletes do that, sometimes they want to get bigger, so they have to calculate those things. Okay? So the way you calculate that is to figure out how many kilocalories you need. So you take your weight in kilos, right, and you multiply that uh, excuse me, um, in pounds divided by 2.2, and you multiply by 1 if you're a man point, times 0.9 if you're a woman, and you multiply that by 24, and that will tell you um, how much you would need for your kilocalories. So let's take an example here. So Megan's a woman. She weighs 130 pounds. So you divide that by 2.2 and you get 59 kilograms. Okay. Those 59 kilograms are then going to be multiplied by 0.9. Okay. And that's going to give you how much she can consume. But then you multiply it by the hours in a day. And that'll tell you that she needs about 1,200 kilo, kilocalories per day to maintain. Okay. That would be for her just to live, you know, sit there, breathe. And then, of course, if she works out, she might can need to consume more. And then, of course, one of the things you have to take in con into consideration here is body frame, body mass, right? So someone who's larger, like myself, would need to have more calories involved. And that's why we take in that amount, uh, that amount of weight, okay? And so that physical activity, if you're sedentary, you have to multiply that by less. If you do a little bit more light walking, moderate or heavy workouts, you can then figure out how much you actually need to perform that physical activity. So if you look at the example here, if she performs light physical activity daily, she multiplies that 0.55 from up here, okay? And she uses that to determine her physical activity use, and that's 701. So that's telling us how much of her calories is going to be to perform that physical activity needed. Then from there, you can then look at their digestion and their absorption, and you can figure out how much more they need. So here's the example, right? So you multiply her original 1795 calories, okay? Because you add that original 1200 and the 701 for the light activity, and you multiply that by 0.1, and that's going to give an extra amount of 197.5. Uh, so she needs on average 2172 calories just to maintain that weight. 
and that's where they come up with that general 2,000 calorie diet number okay so of course it depends on how you maintain it right it's not about having a diet diets don't work because those are temporary they're fads and then eventually you end up changing it and you quit and then you go back to the way you were so in order to do this you have to actually change your whole lifestyle right subtract things that are not going to be needed and so on and if you're doing a good weight loss program you can lose about a half to two pounds per week right so that's the healthy way to do it if you do do faster than that you may end up with other issues okay so here's how it works right so if you intake 3,000 calories but then you output 3,000 calories you're not gonna have a change you're gonna stay the same but if you input 4,000 but you only output 2,000 because you don't really work out much you're gonna increase in weight you're gonna get bigger okay and then over here right if you have someone who's got 2,000 basal calorie need but they burn 3,000 they're burning a thousand calories um, a day which means eventually they're going to decrease in weight because of that okay? and that's all it is it's a calculation now of course if you've got issues like obesity where you end up doing this too often and gaining too much weight then you're going to end up with problems type 1 diabetics they can't produce insulin so they have to have insulin injections that's usually what you're born with okay type 2 is the kind that you gain because you end up with other issues now the driving factor of most of this is going to be obesity if you end up consuming too much then your body is going to basically either fail to take up your insulin and it's not going to do the job so you'll eat your blood sugar will rise and then you're never going to have some the normal type of reaction your pancreas does so you end up with what's called insulin resistance that's a bad thing because then you end up having to eventually um, have medications or even um, dialysis treatment okay and then we've got cardiovascular disease right it all is about cholesterol if you're talking hypertension heart attack stroke if you don't have enough of what we call the good uh, LDLs or the good cholesterol that's the stuff that carries the fat the cholesterol away from the cells to the liver okay, that's a good thing LDLs are the bad ones they carry it from the liver to the cells and that's where it gets caught into our blood vessels right saturated fats are even worse beef dairy coconut oil is the worst those type of fats stay right if you've got trans fats those are things like vegetable shortening stick margin basically if it stays solid at room temperature you don't want that stuff and unfortunately like if you eat tamales that's the stuff that is in there right they use shortening for that or fat so you don't want that now you do want to have good fats so if you have olive oil canola oil if you eat fish cold water fish is a good example like sardines tuna salmon's a great one those give you what are called poly um, unsaturated or omega-3 unsaturated fats so you'll see that quite a bit if you go shopping in the vitamin sections it's omega-3 fish oil stuff like that that's actually the kind of cholesterol that helps actually make your membranes in your vessels get tougher it doesn't get caught in there and clog them up okay and then there are different eating disorders right anorexia is this irrational fear of getting fat and so people refuse to eat and occasionally they'll end up binging with some sort of a purge but unfortunately they end up um, losing quite a bit of weight and it can lead to many many micronutrient deficiencies okay then you've got bulimia where those people they binge and they purge um, and they don't tend to have any weight issues but it, ends, it tends to have issues uh, with their esophagus their stomach their teeth things like that so that tends to be a problem as well and then um, you have binge eating disorder right people get depression and they decide well I'm, I'm hungry you know I'm stressed it's called stress eating that's a real thing right and so there's no purging for that they just binge eat too much and they gain weight and then a lot of things uh, you think a lot of people think that men don't suffer from any of these dysmorphic uh, issues but men do they have muscle dysmorphia uh, a lot of men will look at their like calves or their muscles they feel like they're not developed enough and so they'll try to overcompensate work out quite a bit um, spend a lot of time looking at their body form and stuff like that so that's a male uh, tendency that we tend to have as well so how do you get through this how do you plan a good meal right so they've had many different things they've had food pyramids so here's a of one 
Okay, this is the food pyramid that was used from 2008 to 2011. Okay, um, and notice it tried to break it down into what percentages of food you should have, grains, vegetables, fruits. It's been very hard to do that, and unfortunately, the problem that people had with all this was the numbers down here, right? Six ounces per day, five ounces of that, two cups, one to two tablespoons. It was hard for people to do. So um, instead, um, that actually got scrapped, I think, in 2011 in favor of this, okay? So now it's a matter of portion control, right? Everybody's plate is different sizes because we're all different sized people. And of course, we're different ages and age groups. So depending on where you are, you do tend to have some sort of need. Notice in here, there's no oils, right? No oils to be found everywhere because they assume that you're eating protein, grains, vegetables, fruits, and dairy that may have some of the oils you need, right? So originally the first food pyramids they had actually had a little tip of the pyramid that had a junk food section, right? So it was like a pyramid right here. And at the very top, it was like junk food, okay? Which is not something that these plates do now. And so, of course, it just depends on you. Um, but the thing about humans you have to understand is the best way to keep your metabolism up is to eat more, right? Not to eat big, fat meals, but to eat smaller meals that you can maintain and keep going. So those things are what people should be looking at and trying to do. So this is an example of one. You don't have to follow it, but this is how the food pyramid from 2005 and beyond would have used it. So the big deal is um, nutrition labels. The hard part about nutrition labels is that they're based on a 2,000 calorie diet. That's not everybody's diet. If you're a bigger person, you can probably consume more and still lose weight. If you're a smaller person, 2,000 calories might be too hard to eat and everybody has different metabolisms. So because of that, that's gonna be an issue that people have to think about. So while these labels are useful, they are not the end all be all of nutrition. So again, this is a useful thing. It tells you the percent recommended, the amount of fats um, that you have, where those fats are coming from, cholesterol, sodium, dietary fiber, if something's in there or not. So these are useful, but not nearly the you know, viable of nutrition. They're just ways to tell you whether or not something's good for you um, and for you to be the judge of that on your own. Okay, and then of course, the idea is, should we have dietary supplements? Unfortunately, Dietary supplements are kind of a waste because they tend to be urinated out, right? So if you take a lot of vitamins and minerals, what happens is your body does not actually absorb them. They're water soluble, so they break down and then they end up going straight out into your urine. So it's not really something you need. Um, now, most doctors and dietitians will recommend you don't need to take those. You just need to get them out of the food that you consume. If you get them out of the food you consume, then you're fine. But some people do take some sort of dietary supplement, usually depending on their age group and their needs. Like if you talk about a, a one a day pill, there's a one a day pill for older people, for men, for women, for children, um, for women who are pregnant, prenatal vitamins actually do have some uh, impact. So those things are recommended, but you always should talk to a doctor first before you just go online and go, oh, it said I should take more of this, let's do it. Not always the case. And the point is, you know, you have to have a well-balanced diet. You can't eat too much of one thing. And if you are eating too much of one thing, there's always going to be problems. So, you know, you have moderate levels of fat and low in saturated fats and cholesterol. And then, of course, moderation and all these others. So those are the things that we think about and you should be thinking about when it comes to your diet. Okay, thanks, guys.